welcome to my next episode. I'm going to be talking about Pay2IP and Keysend, Satoshi's lost and found Bitcoin feature. So we're going to look at this feature of Bitcoin. Why is it lost? And during this, we're going to look at the very first code that was released by Satoshi. So this is very interesting. And of course, then talking about what does this mean for the future and what is the future of Pay2IP? First of all, let's go and dig in and find out what is Pay2IP. Well, it's actually one of the original ways to send Bitcoin. If you looked at the very first release of Bitcoin, there's a readme attached to that. And in this, it talks about two ways to send money on this thing called Bitcoin. So one way was to use an IP address and the other way was to use a Bitcoin address. Now, we're all familiar with sending Bitcoin using Bitcoin addresses, but I don't think everyone is aware that originally you could just use an IP address. What happened here? How did this work? Let's unwrap this a bit. It says in there that if the recipient is online, you can enter their IP address and it will connect, get a public key and send a transaction. Interestingly here, it was a vision that, uh, you know, people running Bitcoin would probably be online. And in fact, you could just, why not? Hey, you know, they're online, get their IP address, make a connection and do a transaction that way. Like most peer to peer type applications did at the time. But there was this interesting awareness that maybe not everyone's always online. Maybe people turn off their computers. And so you can send Bitcoin using a Bitcoin address and that was generated using this method of hashing the public key and then receive the transaction the next time they connect. And well, of course, what, what they're really doing is downloading the blockchain and, and seeing that they received the, the transaction that way. One thing that I found really interesting here is that Satoshi mentions that using a Bitcoin address is disadvantageous compared to using the IP address. There's no comment information. That's interesting. So you could as a sender, attach comments with the transaction. But more importantly, there's a bit of privacy lost if the address is used multiple times. But it's an alternative if you can't just be online. So that's really interesting. And of course, that privacy loss, that aspect is still true today. So that's why we have companies that do chain analysis to try to disambiguate the transactions and identify users or groups of users. And so this is interesting that this is the least secure method, which is, of course, the method most used in Bitcoin today. OK, so pay to IP was almost the default method. This is interesting. So here we have a screenshot. This is the very first version of Bitcoin released. This is what it said. It said, enter the recipient's IP address. I'll give an example for online transfer with comments and confirmation comments and confirmation, interesting, or a Bitcoin address. And there he provides an example Bitcoin address. Actually, just a quick pause here. That Bitcoin address is one of the very few addresses that we know belonged to Satoshi. So we know Satoshi had the private keys to that address because he did send coins from that address in a communication with Hal Finney. The point here is that, look, the first thing that this instruction says is enter the IP address. So that was almost like expected almost a default way to do it and there's there's some extra fields in here too right so you can write from and a message and and so this is this was the only option standard so i don't know if there's a plan for other types of transactions at one point but yeah ip address in the in the pay too so okay let's find out what this was really doing let's see what was happening underneath here what was satoshi doing what was he thinking in here so we're going to go into the code, but don't worry. You don't really have to understand how to code. I'm going to try to explain this and kind of uh, walk through in, in a simple term, but, but we'll see at the base level what was going on here. Okay. So the first thing it says, we're going to be putting an IP address in here. So what happens? So here is the code. So one of the things it does is it checks, Hey, is the thing that was put in here, does it look like these numbers or does it look like this string of characters here? So if it is a Bitcoin address, well, that's just a normal payment. And you can see here how it's generating the, the, the transaction uh, using that with a, a script pub key and no, nothing really interesting here. But, you know, what if it was not that? What if it was an IP address? So it parses that, checks it's valid, gets all these extra things like these two from message and puts it all in this this transaction 
and then it sends it. And, and so what's going to happen here? How does it send to an IP address? Here later on in the code, we can see that if you're the sender, it makes sure that if you are not connected to the node or if you're already connecting, that it's just going to sit there. But, you know, if you're not connected, it's going to try to connect you to that IP address. Okay. And of course, you know, maybe it doesn't work, but if it does work, then we're going to do something here. It says we are going to request a public key from the other person. And then it, it goes in and, and does that. And on the receiver side, it receives this request for some reason called check order. Um, and interestingly, the receiver can check the request. Um, wait a minute, this is different. So why so this was never filled in there's just a comment here that it was almost like a, a stub of something that needed to be added so if you are about to receive bitcoins you can check what they were sending so probably something in that from and message field could be checked and and maybe the address could be selected from a set of addresses for a purpose or maybe not even provide an address because you don't have any inventory for that so you're not wanting to accept payment for that but, you know, I want to point out here, this is interesting, is we're talking about in the code here, something product details, orders, approval of orders. This is very much like a merchant language. Like this is clearly something that Satoshi was building to operate like a commerce platform. And, and it's evident in the code, even in the comments. So very interesting uh, that this is how it all started. Now let's, let's go back and see what happened. Well, look, if the receiver rejected, the sender would get a message saying, hey, it was not accepted. So so this is fascinating that you could actually reject receiving a payment. Now, you can't do that with a Bitcoin address. If you give out your Bitcoin address, you're going to receive that transaction whether you want to or not. And this is the basis for things like dusting attacks, right, where people can send small amounts of money to try to see where that goes and trace it. Well, pay to IP you could reject payments that you are not expecting. This is very interesting. Okay, so how does this then happen? So now that you've got it back, what happens? Well, okay, so you've got this um, pub key from, from the, the person that you're about to send to and you can craft a transaction. So you, you accept it and, and you can relay it, um, wait, to the receiver. So you actually send your complete transaction to the receiver and they can see that, hey, is this the correct transaction? Is this valid? And, and so then it gets broadcast actually by the receiver. So you send the payment transaction to the seller, which is actually the receiver. Again, we've got this merchant language going on here. And so at the receiver side, they are broadcasting it. So that's really fascinating. And interestingly, it looks like it does get broadcast twice, but but as a seller, you can guarantee that this transaction, I broadcast it, I have the full transaction. So that's interesting. So then you can send it back saying, yep, everything broadcast. Okay, looks good. And send back confirmation to the seller that the payment was received, it looks good, and so on. So let's look at a summary then of pay to IP in the original Bitcoin. Well, the sender connects to the receiving node by an IP address if they're online. The sender can request an address to send to. The receiver can reject receiving a payment. And if they do accept, they can respond back with a message saying, oh, thanks for the payment for whatever X, Y, Z. The sender then creates a transaction and sends it to the receiving node. The receiving node, because they have that transaction, they can broadcast it. And the receiver can confirm to the sender that, yes, it was a transaction good. It's on the blockchain. Thank you. Okay, that's what it was. So why don't we have it today? Well, the feature was removed in 2011 with the version 0 0.8 because it was plainly not secure. And why was it not secure? Well, because it relied on the internet. So the sender and the receiver on an IP address would be communicating over a network. But something that could happen is, is a man in the middle attack where an attacker could intercept this communication. And when a sender is asking for a public key, 
the attacker, instead of the receiver replying with the public key, the attacker could provide their public key. And now that Bitcoin payment goes to the attacker and not the receiver. So, so this attacker is spoofing the identity of a receiver. And because Bitcoin addresses are uniquely generated for each transaction, well, they should be for privacy, that could not be tracked. And, and so the attacker could walk away with those Bitcoins. So it makes good sense that, you know, because the, the way that the internet is implemented, there is no cryptography on top of this that was removed for, for safety. So is that it? Is this, is this feature abandoned? Like, do we want this? What are we going to do? Well, there is something. There is a feature that looks just like pay to IP on the Lightning Network, and it's called Keysend Transactions. Okay, so what this is is it's using the Onion protocol for networking on the Lightning Network to privately exchange data for transactions, and it's a way to do secure invoiceless payments, meaning that like we might be familiar with on a Lightning payment. You receive an invoice that's good for a one-time payment that gets paid, transmitted through the Lightning Network, and you shouldn't be able to pay that again. Whereas in this case, there is no invoice. So what, what happens with the Keysend transaction? The Onion protocol and the Lightning Network. So I just create a uh, kind of made up uh, network topology here. And, and let's say we have a sender and a receiver. Now, every node on the network has a public key that's exposed. Okay, so that public key identifies the node. It's not an address. It is a unique identifier for that node that you can guarantee that that's used. And that's used for part of the encryption with the Onion protocol. The first thing you do is you have to find a root. Now, it does not have to be an optimal root. It just has to be a valid root. And there could be many different routes. And then I'll talk about why it doesn't matter. And, and actually why it's important to have multiple routes for key send as well. So, what then happens is the sender generates something called the pre-image for the transaction. On a normal lightning transaction, the receiver would generate the pre-image, not the sender. But in this case, it's the sender that will generate a pre-image. And that pre-image gets encoded using the channel and the public keys of each of those nodes into an onion network packet. Okay. And then that gets transmitted through there to the receiver, the receiver being the final recipient in, in the center unpacks the data payload. There they create the transaction that gets propagated back to the network and all the channel balances are updated and it's finalized. Okay. And so now this is a lightning network transaction. However, there is no invoice required and only the receiver's public key is required to initiate it. How does this work for privacy and security? Well, one thing is that along the route, you still don't know the sender and receiver because those are encrypted in the onion packet. So you can only peel off one layer of the onion and it's intentionally designed to use random routes. So each time we try not to use the same route from the sender to the receiver, and you can improve your privacy in that way. So the more routes that you can find through the network, even complicated and kind of out of the way ones where you might have to pay more fees, that's good. That gives you more privacy because the intermediary nodes would have a harder time trying to identify what kind of transmission is going on. And because it's on the Onion protocol, the package is encrypted. One other interesting thing that's done is shadow nodes. So somebody might look at the size of this package going through on this, on you know, Onion wrapped, and, and figure out how long the path is. Well, one of the things you can do is you can add fake nodes that go beyond the receiver in order to kind of hide how long it is and who the receiver might be along this. So additional privacy in that sense. And, and the final thing is because the node that is receiving and every node along the way actually has a public key that's known, you can verify that only the person that you intended to send to is going to be the recipient. Doesn't matter what their IP address is. Doesn't matter if there's someone trying to snoop on the traffic. It's all encrypted anyway. But only the person that's the intended recipient with their public key can unlock that Lightning Network transaction. So the transaction. So once the sender and receiver have communicated, it looks just like a regular Lightning Network transaction. The channel balances are updated. But one thing 
as I mentioned before, is that the pre-image is not able to be used as a proof of payment, whereas in a normal lighting transaction with the pre-image generated by the receiver in the invoice, if the sender knows the actual pre-image, they have proof that they have made a payment so that the receiver can't say, oh, but I didn't receive it. Well, hey, I've got the pre-image, the hash matches what's in your invoice, this is paid. So it does miss that aspect of the Lightning Network that you can't prove a payment happened. But that could also be a beneficial in your use case if you want privacy. The other thing is no invoice was required. This is actually, I think, a benefit. It's very much easier. All you need is their public key and boom, they can send. So it's very similar to this original pay to IP, but there's better privacy, there's better security. But if you want, this is real, you can try it. So I've confirmed this to work with Lightning Network Daemon. Uh, if you configure it to accept key sense, so there's a configuration setting that you can go in there and there's a mobile wallet breeze. I put up here a QR code, which simply has in here. And if you look down here, you can see it's the public key of that node and connection info so that you can connect to that node if, if you don't know it. Um, so that QR code works. And, and here I, I have a tablet here. I'm going to just uh, do a live demo here of, of this. So I'm going to scan that QR code. Okay, so I scan that QR code. And I'm just going to make a payment of say, let's do 100 Satoshi. I'm just going to make this payment. And there it's going to be processing my payment. So it might take a little bit longer because we're searching over the Lightning Network for a viable route. Okay. And it looks like it's completed. So it depends on what route it takes, but here you can see um, the payment completed and it had a fee of 12 Satoshi. So that's it. That's a, a key send transaction. It works. You are welcome to try it as well. If you have the Breeze wallet or, or any Lightning implementation that supports key send, you can send to that and it should come through. Finally, thank you for watching this video. I'm going to be trying some new videos, some different types of content. I want to go and look into that early Bitcoin with Satoshi, that early Bitcoin address that he generated. I want to go and look into the pre-release Bitcoin and we'll be looking at how Satoshi kind of envisioned Bitcoin even before he released it, before he even had the Genesis block. So if you like this content, I appreciate your support and looking forward to making more of these videos.